Have you ever had the feeling that you knew what someone was going to say just before he said it? Or have you ever walked into a strange room and had the sensation that you'd been there before? Well, if you have, you've taken a small step beyond. Now watch a giant step. Sooner or later, each of us feels the need to escape. The country folk go to the city, the city folk go to the country. This, for example, is a very pleasant form of escape. Here on this mountaintop, we are a mere 10 miles from a city of 80,000 people, each of whom, like us, has fashioned a small cage of reality out of the chaos of unreality, each of whom, like us, lives his life by the steady, reassuring ticking of the clock, forgetting that the clock is merely man's invention and that tomorrow is a creation of the human mind, forgetting that there is only the constant now. But if that be true, where does that leave yesterday? Now here comes a man from that city below, that city of ticking clocks, was about to escape his cage of reality. for the stamp of the U.S. government. You scared me. Why? Well, first the telephone call, and then I came up to an empty house. See, so I got roaring drunk and fell off the mountain? Well, I didn't. I went out for a walk. I love it here. So wild and lonely. <laughs> Always seems such a joke. The full bottle is proof that I have a will of iron. You look absolutely wonderful. But five days in the country won't do for some people. Why did you want to talk to me about Ellen? What was so urgent? I checked for the hospital today. This person goes home at the end of the week. I knew that. Harry, when I think of how close I came to killing that man. Well, you didn't. No, I didn't. I didn't even see him. I was so drunk he wasn't even a blur. Now, come on, Ellen. What next? What new escapade for the madcap alcoholic? Maybe a school bus, wipe out the whole kindergarten, really hit the jackpot. No. I'm not smashing into anything, Harry. Of course you won't. I, I'm through nearly killing people, of shouting drunken curses in police stations, of being bundled into straitjackets and whipped off to sanitariums. Oh, and seeing lovely little goodies drift through the walls. Oh, I didn't tell you. Last time I was pursued by an open coffin. Now, that's a little more original than bats and pink elephants, wouldn't you say? Fun and games are over. Guess why? I don't know why, but I'm sure I'm in favor of it. Because I've stopped kidding myself about us. About us? Harry, I have a little speech to make. A simple, sober little speech which couldn't be phoned in and which should have been said 500 drinks ago. I don't need alcohol anymore. I don't need you anymore. I mean it, Harry. You mean what? I mean, at last, I've faced the truth. It's a tired little cliche, isn't it? But that's just what happened. And I, I don't need a drink instead. And I don't need to have an affair instead. And I don't need anything instead. Where's the other bottle of booze? Oh, so I sound drunk. 
Want me to walk a straight line, officer? Because I can. Ellen, well, this is all a lot of female emotionalism. Now, it's probably your hormones or something. Why don't you stay up here for the rest of the week the way that Dr. Mason told you to? I intend to. And then what? I don't know what then. Maybe get the governor to declare a goodbye Harry with the parades and dancing in the streets. Oh, and I know what's wrong with us, and so do you. Indeed, I do. Seventeen years times 365 days times 24 hours, drip, drip, drip. No, Ellen, I'm sorry. It's not that simple. Mind if we skip that? You want to sweep it all under the rug again and pretend it doesn't exist? I don't even think about that anymore. You don't talk about it. You drink instead. Spare me the amateur analysis. Ellen, where was I when we became strangers? Right here. You've never believed me. Nope. What do you want me to do? Stand on my head? Oh, let's not talk about you it. You never want to talk about it. Oh, and I don't want to fight. I'm not fighting. Lovers fight. You better be getting back. The way it's snowing, the road may be closed pretty soon. And wouldn't it be that much of a catastrophe if I spent the night here? Harry, it wouldn't be any more of a catastrophe than every night. I think I like you better when you're drunk. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I'm trying to reach Portersville, but I got lost in all this snow. Where's your car? It's down the road. I, I've been driving around in circles for I don't know how long. You should have turned left about two miles back. This is a dead end. Yes? It's me again. Uh, it'll take me ten years to get out of these hills. And this is the only house I can find anywhere around here. Would you mind if I'd use your telephone? I'm all alone here. My wife's in the hospital. There's an emergency phone just as you turn off the highway. Well, how am I going to find it in all the snow? I told you, I'm all alone. Thanks a lot. Young man. Huh? Of course you may use the phone. Help yourself. It's right over here. Thanks. I'm sorry I was so... I'm sorry your wife's in the hospital. Your phone must be out of order. I dial and dial and nothing happens. But it was working.
everything's okay. You better? Okay, that's better. That's better. How gentle you are. I'd forgotten how gentle you could be. Are you okay? Are you, you sure you're okay? You're okay. I, I don't want to leave you alone here. It's nine o'clock. Visiting hours are over. Well, I don't know what I'd have said to her even if I did see her. just had a baby. An eight pound, five ounce girl. Great, big, beautiful kid. Except she was dead. I only saw her for a second. She was wrapped up in a little blanket. She looked like a life-size little doll. She had enough hair on her for a five-year-old. You, you hand these things out, and, and um, everybody slaps you on the back and says, congratulations, Dad. My wife congratulated me when they were uh, taking her out of the, the uh, delivery room. I went over to her, and she wouldn't even let me hold her hand. She said, well, this is your lucky day. The baby died. Lucky day, I remember. Her lucky day. She thinks I wanted that. Didn't you? We've only been married for a year and a half. We're flat broke. I work three times a week, and I'm lucky to get that. I, I guess you don't know what it means to, to have nothing to come home to. But fried liver. And maybe a Kino movie. Is there some law against trying to get some fun out of life? You settle down soon enough. Ellen and I wanted to travel. We, that was our dream. We wanted to rub shoulders with everybody else in the world. Well, you just can't do that with a kid strapped to your back. We'd saved up about $200. And then, surprise, Ellen was pregnant. So I, I, I told her that, OK, so you're pregnant. It's not the end of the world. We can do something about it. But uh, she wouldn't. I guess that sounds awful selfish to you, but let me tell you something. I got a little bomb in my pocket. It's a time bomb. It's called a draft card. This one's got one A on it. If I've got any living to do, I've got to do it right now. I haven't got time to be unselfish. You are lucky the baby died. <sighs> I, I was sitting in that, uh, in that hospital waiting room. Oh, <laughs> All the rest of those expectant fathers pacing up and down, jumping out of their skins every time a nurse went by. A bunch of boobs. And all of a sudden, a kid started to yell. I thought, hey, that must be my kid. Well, it wasn't, but uh, the funniest feeling came over me. All right, I, I know I don't fit into the pattern. I mean, I'm not crazy about hot dogs, and I don't go out bowling with the boys, and I don't... I never went over and felt every time the baby moved. I didn't go out rushing out in the middle of the night to buy Ellen pickles and ice cream. But sitting there in that waiting room, I began to realize that whatever was going to be born would live and breathe and grow up and be a part of the world. Just because Ellen and I love each other. You, 
did you ever get into Portersville very much? If you wanted to see a really beautiful girl, you could go into the National Bank. She was a blonde secretary behind the desk in the escrow department. There's an expression on her face. It's a look in her eyes. Like something... Like just being alive is something so red hot and special that you'd be in all the headlines. Sometimes I used to just go in there and look at her and say, baby, well, I, I guess I, I guess I catch on slow. But sitting there in that hospital waiting room, it really began to hit me what this child really meant. The flesh and blood proof of what Ellen and I really were to each other. And all of a sudden this feeling came over me. It made all the cities and the mountains and the trains and the countries seem like nothing. So then when they uh, came and told me that the uh, things weren't going very well in the operating room, the delivery room. Well, they got a chaplain in the hospital. Maybe I should have gone down there to pray, but I went to the men's room and cried. And then I told myself that everything was going to be okay. I don't know why, but I felt absolutely sure of it. And um, just for good luck and to uh, show my confidence, I guess, I, I got some of these things in the lobby. And uh, then I went upstairs, and uh, that's when they were wheeling her out. And uh, that's when she said it to me. This is your lucky day. The baby died. We, we could live together for 50 years. She'll never think I wanted that baby. And it'll ruin everything. I do believe you. Am I so different? Am I so changed? Who are you? Dr. Mason an hour ago. Yes, of course I'm sure. Yes, of course I am. Well, he couldn't have left then. It's only 20 minutes drive. I, I am. I am controlling my... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Dr. Mason, I, I'm not imagining this. It's not like before. You see, I, I called you, and you're here, and he was here the way he was. He was here. I'm not drunk. Ellen, I made a stupid mistake. I put your records in the inactive file. I didn't open that bottle. <laughs> I suppose he did that. He did. Please believe me, believe me. He was here. I was where, Ellen? He was in a burning car, that's where he was. And by extremely good luck, I saw him as I came up to see you. Are you all right? I was out cold for a while, but I'm all right now. Ellen, 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 how did it start this time? You hand these out and they slap you on the back and say, congratulations, Dad. It's a boy. Well, she couldn't have had much to drink. The bottle's almost full. She's not drunk. Well, then what is she? Good night, Doctor. Harry, 
I think I know Ellen's problems a little better than you do. Do you? Ellen, I'm going to leave some of these for you, and you can take them if you need them. You know how you've had them before, and I'll call you in the morning. And, uh, I think a couple of these might help you. Good night. Ellen, what happened here tonight? You wouldn't believe me. Try me. He believed her. He had to. Well, was it all a delusion? It's a boy. Now, that certainly was not a delusion. Then what happened to Ellen Grayson? Was it an hallucination? Was it an accident in time? Or did the unconscious Harry Grayson will himself back to the man he was to convince Ellen of his love? What you've just seen is not so uncommon as you might think in the annals of psychic experience. Man has just begun to probe the world beyond his cage of reality. In that constant and marvelous and eternal world of the now, who knows what he'll find.